Good afternoon. Welcome. Welcome to Harvard. Welcome PPLC students to Cambridge, Massachusetts. Welcome to the Kennedy School of Government. And welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. My name is Joe McCarthy. I'm Senior Associate Dean here at the Kennedy School. And it is an honor uh, for me to welcome you here today. Let me say a special word of welcome to the 2007 Public Policy and Leadership Conference participants who are seated in these rows in the center here of the forum. And they, I, think that's, I think this is the best looking group we've had in all the years. Don't you, don't you think this? Yes, and so we're thrilled to have them here. We're honored to have you with us. You come from many colleges across the United States. And this program began several years ago as Kennedy School Student Initiative. The students came to us and said that we should reach out to college students in their first couple of years and alert them, inspire them, tell them about opportunities available for careers in public service, as well as to the possibility of attending graduate programs in public policy and public administration. You don't just have to get a JD or an MBA in life to be successful, and certainly not in the world of public service. This had not occurred to me before because I was lucky. I always knew that public service was a wonderful opportunity and a wonderful calling. See, I got to grow up in Washington, D.C. in the days of John F. Kennedy and Robert F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King, who reminded me to ask what I could do for my country and to have a dream and to keep that dream. It's not so easy today to be inspired in those directions, but you'll find that inspiration here and in other schools like this, University of Michigan, University of California, Berkeley, Princeton, they've all, University of Maryland, they've all helped us develop this PPLC program and we are grateful to them for that. The excitement lives on here at the Kennedy School and it's very contagious. And we hope you'll catch a v very strong case of it and take it back to your friends and classmates at your various colleges. There are still great public service visionaries in this country, but they're not all in Washington anymore. Some of them are what we call social entrepreneurs. And you're about to hear from one of them and engage in a dialogue with him. To introduce him, it is my pleasure to give you one of the most terrific of our many terrific students here at the Kennedy School, Ms. Jewel James. Jewel. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Dean McCarthy for that warm welcome. He is my academic advisor, so he has to say nice things about me, and I appreciate it. Um, I would also like to take the time to recognize uh, the other two coordinators of the Public Policy and Leadership Conference that I've had the pleasure with working with over the past couple months to put this conference together. We have Peter G., who's a second year MPP student here. And Alexis Watson, who couldn't be here right now because she's busy still planning the conference. Um, and so on behalf of Peter, Alexis, and myself, we can't really say enough of how grateful we are to Dean McCarthy and to the admissions office for all the support for the conference and personal support uh, of us over the past couple of months. It is my honor and, and my honor and privilege this evening to introduce our keynote speaker. And as I was reading his bio, I thought about something my mother used to tell me when I was growing up. She used to say, and bear with me because my mother was Jamaican, so she had a funny way of saying things, but she used to say, Jewel, you can either be a thermometer or a thermostat. And what she meant by that was you could be a thermometer, and you know we use thermometers to uh, gauge our temperature and tell us if you have a fever. You could, use, you could be a thermometer and talk about the ills of the world, or you could be a thermostat in which you can tell the temperature of the room in a thermostat, but you can also use it to change it. So you could be a thermostat and talk about the ills of the world and change it. This evening, we have 
um, an extraordinary speaker with us who has dedicated his life to changing the world, to make it a better place, not to sound cliche. Um, and in fact, we were just talking him back, and he's in the process of starting an organization called Be the Change America. So it's our hope that through his remarks, he will inspire all of us to do our part to make this world a better place, not just for ourselves, but for generations to come. Alan Casey is the co-founder and former CEO of City Year, a national youth service corps that inspired the development of AmeriCorps, the nation's federal investment in national youth service. Founded in 1988 with 50 young people in service in Boston, City Year is now a global organization with an annual budget of more than $40 million, enlisting more than 1,000 young adults nationwide for demanding year of full-time community service, civic engagement, and leadership development. City Year also provides strategic leadership for the national service movement. Mr. Casey is a magna cum laude graduate of Harvard College and a cum laude graduate of Harvard Law School. He served in Senator Gary Hart's 1984 presidential campaign as a field coordinator in New Hampshire and in the national office. In 1991, President Bush appointed Mr. Casey to serve on the board of directors of the Commission on National and Community Service. He served as vice chair of the commission until 1993. Mr. Casey currently serves on the board of directors of Citizen Schools, Harvard Alumni Association, New Profit Inc., the Partnership for Public Service, Share Our Strength, and on the advisory board of America's Promise and the Center for Public Leadership at the John F. Kennedy School of Government. I'm not sure how he finds time to do all of this, <laughs> but he does. In 1994, Time Magazine named Mr. Casey one of America's 50 outstanding leaders under 40, and last year, the US News and World Reports named Mr. Casey one of America's best leaders, and we we're privileged to have him last semester as an IOP fellow, and we're honored that he would join us this evening to deliver our keynote speech for the Public Policy and Leadership Conference. Mr. Casey. Thank you, Dean McCarthy, and thank you, Jewel, for that really warm and wonderful introduction. I've never been described as a thermometer before, but uh, thermostat, right, got to get it straight, but, uh, but I appreciate it. I think, that, I think uh, your mother reminds me of my mother, and you'll hear that when I talk about her in a minute. Uh, it's great for me to be back at Harvard. As Jewel mentioned, I went to college here. I went to law school here. I had a wonderful semester here as a fellow just last fall, so clearly I can't get enough of Harvard. Uh, it's a wonderful institution, and it's great to be here. I'm happy to have my wife, Vanessa, here, and my four-year-old daughter, Mirabelle, who are here somewhere in, in the audience. Uh, and when I asked my daughter, Mirabel what I should talk to you about today, she said, well, you could tell them about when I was a baby. <laughs> and then I said, that's good. What else should I tell them? And she said, without skipping a beat, tell them to make the world a better place. And as usual, Mirabel got it just right. I want to congratulate all of you here in the front who were selected to be part of the Public Policy Leadership Conference. And I want to thank you those of you who took the time to email me your thoughts about the great challenges our country faces, our great strengths, politics, and your own ideas for what should be done. I really appreciated learning from you, and I learned a lot. You clearly have serious concerns and excellent ideas, and I'm sure your time here will be put to good use. I hope all of you will decide to be active in politics and public service by serving a cause larger than yourself, or getting behind a candidate you believe in, or hopefully running for office yourself one day. I believe your generation will help to put America back on track. I believe your generation will restore America's spirit of rugged idealism and help to develop a new politics, a new agenda, a new role for government, and a new public philosophy for our country. And that's what I'd like to talk to you about today. Over a quarter century ago, in the presidential campaign of 1980, one candidate framed the entire election around one simple question. Are you better off than you were four years ago? I believe that central appeal to self-interest, which has dominated too much of our politics, our government, and our public philosophy ever since, was absolutely the wrong question. The question shouldn't be, are you better off? The question should be, are we better off? Our Constitution does not begin with the words, I, a member of the United States, in order to get more for me. It begins with the words, we, the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union. What does that mean? A, a more perfect union fundamentally means we're all in this together. Our founders didn't ask, are you better off? 
they called upon each other and their fellow citizens to serve and to sacrifice for the common good. They asserted their ideals in America's freedom on July 4th, 1776 by stating, in support of this declaration, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortune, and our sacred honor. Our founders were rugged and idealistic. They invented a new nation unlike any before or ever since, not with cynical appeals, but with the timeless ideals of equality, liberty, and justice for all. What makes America unique, what makes America, America, are these shared ideals. These ideals brought my father and my mother's family to this country, to the only nation on earth that people utter in the same breath with the word dream. My own journey of rugged idealism began, as I'm sure it is with many of you, clearly it was with Jewel, with your mom, with my family. My mom, a nurse, is the classic Italian. She will fall in love with you over the phone. Mom believes in giving and not simply accumulating. She often reminds me, you'll never see a U-Haul behind a hearse. Think about that. It's true. Mom taught me to appreciate and try to unlock the good in everyone. She taught me to walk in other people's shoes. Most of all, she taught me the extraordinary power of unconditional love. My dad, a doctor, was born in Tehran, educated in Europe and then came to America in the 1950s. Like many immigrants, he chose freedom over tyranny and was inspired by our democratic ideals. Fiercely patriotic, my dad raised me to believe that America is the greatest nation in the world. And he taught me to deeply love this country. But dad also taught me to understand that there is sometimes a gap between the ideals of America and government policy. He taught me about Mossadegh, the popular elected prime minister of Iran who was leading Iran to democracy. But in 1953, our CIA joined with the British government to overthrow Mossadegh and return the shot of power because Mossadegh had nationalized the oil field. And in one fell swoop, the march of democracy in Iran was ground to a halt. So my dad urged me to love America enough to want to help realize its ideals. Inspired by my family and Gandhi saying that, quote, you must become the change you seek in the world I joined with my college roommate, Michael Brown, to found City Year. As Jules said, a domestic Peace Corps that unites young adults from all possible backgrounds, the full diversity of America, for a year of full-time community service. We started City Year because we believe that young people, like all of you, can change the world. Like many college students, like many of you, I'm sure, we stayed up late talking about the issues of the day and how we wanted to try to change the world. We struggled with the question of why in a country that's the richest in the history of the world, there still remains so much deep poverty and deep need. We concluded that it was because people didn't have a chance to be directly exposed to the needs of their society, that often people didn't realize that one person could make a difference, and that there were too few experiences where people could come together, especially from very different backgrounds, and join together to work together for the common good. We came to believe that a program of universal voluntary national service would more than anything else fundamentally change our country for the better. We began to dream and to imagine what a world with that kind of program would look like. Imagine if every fall, in addition to the millions of young people marching off to college, there were at least a million committing to a year of full-time community service. Imagine if the Peace Corps wasn't just 7,500 people a year out of a country of 300 million, but was 100,000 people every year, sending citizen American ambassadors to every corner of the globe. Imagine turning on each generation's justice nerve, that inner voice that says, each person can make a difference, and every person must try. Imagine a nation and a world in which we truly felt and truly were that more perfect union all of us serving together. This vision captured our imagination. So in 1988, we started CITIA right here in Boston with 50 core members. We were honored when President Bush chose us as a national demonstration program in 1991, and when President Clinton used CITIA as a model for his AmeriCorps program. And this spring, the 500,000th AmeriCorps member will enter service. So now we think it's time to take this idea to scale through a new GI Bill of Rights for the 21st century that will guarantee the American dream for every young person in America. 
After World War II, the GI Bill built the modern American middle class by enabling millions of returning veterans to go to college to buy their first home or to start their own business. A new GI Bill for the 21st century would say to all young Americans, to all of you, you can get the American dream, but you have to earn it. For each year of full-time service that you commit through either the military or the Peace Corps or AmeriCorps, the country will give to you one year's tuition and board at a state university, a voucher. That voucher could be used for a year at public or private university or towards a down payment on a home or to start your own business or nonprofit. Think of it. The American dream of college education, home ownership, or becoming an entrepreneur could be made available to every person who is willing to serve. And America would become a nation of service. At their essence, City Year, AmeriCorps, the idea of national service, are about tapping America's greatest natural, renewable resource, rugged idealism. Now, by idealism, I don't mean naivete, namby-pamby, pie-in-the-sky schemes, or even simple optimism. The dictionary defines idealism as, quote, the practice of forming ideals and living under their influence. Idealism is simply deciding what ideals are important to you and which ones you're going to try and live by. History teaches us that all great change begins with an idealistic notion. It is the voice that says, often simply, often movingly, often powerfully, always insistently, things aren't what they could be. Things aren't what they should be. We can do better, and we must try. Some people claim that America was founded by rugged individualists. I disagree. At each key point in our history, America has been built by rugged idealists people who came together around shared ideals and fought relentlessly to put them into practice, people who weren't intimidated by the severity of the challenge or the scorn of the cynics. When our forefathers threw the tea into Boston Harbor, that was rugged idealism. When the abolitionists insisted that slavery was morally wrong and had to end, that was rugged idealism. When the suffragists fought for women to be treated as full citizens, that was rugged idealism. When Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat and go to the back of the bus, that was rugged idealism. Idealism works. It has the power to change lives, nations, and the course of history. Look at how the world has changed just in your lifetimes. In 1989, when we started our first city year program, there were 69 democracies in the world. Today, there are 121. The Berlin Wall came down without a single shot being fired. The Soviet Union disintegrated. Eastern Europe was liberated, and free market economics swept the globe. Nelson Mandela went from prisoner to president in a remarkably peaceful revolution. Peace came to Northern Ireland in the Good Friday Agreement. For the first time in human history, a majority of people on this planet live under some form of democracy. And people all over the world are fully occupying what President Harry Truman said was the highest office in a democracy, that of citizen. This is the most powerful movement of our time. We have crossed the tipping point. Citizens all over the world are seizing their power and forging the future. In the US alone, we have gone from 464,000 nonprofits in 1989 when we started City Year to more than 1.4 million today. And around the world, the growth in the civil society sector has been by more than 43% in the past 10 years. Time Magazine named each one of you it's 2006 person of the year. Technological innovations through things like Google and MySpace and Facebook and Meetup and YouTube are opening up a world of unprecedented opportunity for citizen empowerment, citizen movements, and citizen-based democracy. Now, along with these historic-based breakthroughs, we've had our share of traumatic events and challenges. Most recently, the terrible day of September 11th the Indian Ocean tsunami, Hurricane Katrina, the Iraq war, genocide in the Sudan, AIDS, terrorism, global poverty, global warming, the ongoing struggle for peace in the Middle East, and more. And in the face of all this, we continue to be hampered by division and polarization, by pundits and partisans who are constantly trying to divide us into red and blue states, rather than recognizing that we need to be reminded at the end of the day, 
We are all red, white, and blue, Americans. There is a way forward, and that is to win decisively the battle between idealism and cynicism, the central battle of our time. Why? Because cynicism leads to apathy and fear. Idealism inspires action and change. Idealists act, cynics react. Idealists create, cynics tear down. Idealists say, let's go, how can I help? I have an idea. Cynics respond, it'll never work. Why bother? And how do I know you're doing it for the right reasons? All of you who were selected to the PPLC have the potential to be rugged idealists. And we need you to be. Why? Because there is so much to do. We may be the richest country in the history of the world, but for the fourth straight year, more Americans are living in poverty. 37 million. More than 13 million of them are our children. 47 million Americans don't have health insurance. 10 million of them, children. Three and a half million people will be homeless in America this year. More than a million, children. It's no wonder that a recent study conducted by America's Promise showed that fully 40% of our young people believe that the American dream won't be real for them. And about one billion people, one billion people, a sixth of the world's population, lives on less than one dollar per day. Millions of people every year die needlessly from poverty and diseases we know how to treat, like malaria and tuberculosis and AIDS. These numbers aren't just statistics. Every one of them represents a fellow member of the human family. Taken together, they are a wake-up call that we must find new and better ways to build that more perfect union of prosperity, opportunity, liberty, and most of all, justice for all. For as Martin Luther King said, a threat to justice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Our times demand transformative change, and that will only come if we commit to be the change. We need a new politics, a new role for government, a new agenda, and all together they will add up to a new public philosophy to govern our country. All of us, rather than shying away from politics because we fear it is too partisan, too nasty, too corrupt, must work together to define a new politics that brings concerned citizens in and pushes the influence of money out. A new politics that elevates the common good over the special interests. A new politics that moves beyond partisan shouting, that isn't left versus right, but rather takes the best of both. A new politics that chooses rugged idealism over debilitating cynicism. And as we work to build a new politics, we must also define a new role for government. There are those who want us to believe that government can't work. So it's no surprise that they've given us a government that doesn't work. Then there are those who think that government alone can solve all of our problems. If we just throw more money at it, our job is done. They're both wrong. It's not more government or less government. It's effective government and big citizenship. All over America, people at the grassroots, social entrepreneurs, are proving there is a new way to address social ills. The skills and techniques of entrepreneurship, innovation, business success, can and must be applied to the public sector. Organizations like Teach for America, Citizen Schools, Jumpstart, Year Up, Bell, KIPP, New Profit, New Leaders for New Schools, and many, many more are demonstrating that change is possible, but they need to be brought to scale. Rather than trying to solve all of our problems from the top down and tell us what to do, government should set standards, identify what works, create competition, reward results, and invest to make the best innovations, organizations, and ideas available for everyone. In addition to a new politics and a new role for government, we need a new agenda, one that is bold, imaginative, innovative, and steeped in practical experience and what works. And most of all, one not limited by what pundits say is politically possible, but rather one that is inspired by what we all know is morally needed for our neighborhoods, our country, and the world. A new politics and a new agenda must come from the people. Join with your friends here and back on your campuses and think about developing your own Young Leaders of America agenda. Here are several cornerstones for a new national agenda that might get you started. First, you won't be surprised to hear from me that I think we need to begin with a new program of universal national service and a new GI Bill of Rights to bring in a new era of big citizenship. 
Second, we need to revolutionize our educational system and bring it into the 21st century. We need to ensure that every single child can reach their full potential. And we need to make teaching the most revered profession in the land. We need a new grand bargain with our teachers by which we will dramatically increase teacher pay. We will also say we need longer school days and longer school years and other reforms. Third, we need a new social compact to make the American dream real for all of our citizens and end poverty as we know it. Fourth, we need to develop a new grand strategy for America's role in the world and redefine national security for the 21st century. Just as our great leaders after World War II built new alliances and new strategies and new institutions to deal with the challenges of their time, we need to do the same for our time to tackle nuclear proliferation and terrorism, the energy crisis, and more. And America must restore its moral leadership in the world through a foreign policy that reflects our ideals, not one that betrays them. Fifth, a more perfect union requires a truer democracy. That means same-day registration and election day holiday so more people can vote and more voices are heard. An end to faulty electronic balloting, TV time for candidates who qualify, and lobbying reform. Most of all, we need you. Fill out the rest of this agenda with your own ideas on the economy, the environment, immigration, health care, issues that matter most to you, issues you wrote me about, and fight for them. Throughout history, you have to remember, young people have often been the driving force for change. Gandhi began his work on civil disobedience in South Africa when he was only 25 years old. Nelson Mandela co-founded the African National Congress Youth League when he was 26 years old. Alice Paul was 28 years old when she co-founded the Congressional Women's League for Universal Suffrage. Cesar Chavez was 19 years old when he founded his first labor union, the National Agricultural Workers Union. Martin Luther King was 26 years old when he led the Montgomery bus boycott. Wendy Cobb was 22 years old, fresh out of college, when she founded Teach for America. And it was students your age who in the 1960s launched the sit-ins, joined the Freedom Rides, organized voter registration drives, and marched to demand civil rights. It was students who organized the teach-ins and the protests and walked door to door in the New Hampshire presidential primary to end the Vietnam War. It was students who in 1976 rose up in Soweto and said that apartheid must end. It was students who organized the Tiananmen Square uprising in China, demanding freedom and democracy. And their sacrifice sparked the Velvet Revolution across Eastern Europe that ended the Soviet Empire. And I have no doubt it will be students including some of you here, who will say that we have long passed the time for non-binding resolutions and that we must end the Iraq war now, prevent a war with Iran, and restore America's moral leadership in the world. And it will be students, including some of you here, who will finally raise the moral consciousness of our nation and insist that we can, must, and will end extreme poverty. And it will be students, including some of you here, who will finally get us all to wake up and realize that if we don't deal with global warming, we may lose our planet. And it will be students, including some of you here, who lead the effort to create a true America. I'd like to close with an old Sufi teaching story. It goes like this. A holy man was sitting under a tree, praying. And by and by, along came a homeless child an isolated and severely disabled man, and a woman who had been robbed and badly beaten. Seeing them, the holy man cried out, Great God, how can a loving creator see such things and do nothing about them? And out of the long silence, God replied, I did do something. I made you. So if you want change, be the change. Having heard from you in your emails, I can say the future is in good hands. Together, we can be the change. Together, we can unleash America's rugged idealism. Together, we can make the world a better place. Thank you all very much.
what fun. Friday afternoon at the Kennedy School talking about rugged idealism. It just doesn't get any better than this. And at the Kennedy School, this is not about one-way lectures. What we do here is we have dialogue, we have discussion. So now it's your turn. It is our custom always to have questions and answers. And some of you have already prepared some of your questions and sent them ahead to Alan Casey. I'm going to ask you to line up, if you would, at the microphones. There are two on the floor here, and then two, I feel like a flight attendant, and then two up in uh, each of the, uh, the, the uh, what do we call them? Loges, loges, thank you, Mr. White. Uh, the loges up there. Please do, when you come to the microphone, identify yourself. Uh, if, you're from, if you're one of our PPLC participants, uh, tell us that, and tell us what college you're visiting here from. We would like to know that. And make your question, please, uh, brief, uh, so that we can get as many in as possible, more brief than my introduction. And I want to get some PPLC people up here as well, too. Cassandra, there's room there. One of my other advisees back there in the, uh, is a PPLC. So please, you've prepared some questions uh, on challenges and uh, uh, solutions and uh, running for office. Uh, so please be sure that you get up to the mics and ask some questions as well. We will start with you, sir. Uh, hi, my name is Charles Sigano. I'm a MPA student here at the Kennedy School. Um, your, your idea of a GI Bill, I think, is uh, a fascinating one. Uh, and and I, I suppose I've been having something sort of similar turning over the back of my mind. It seems that America would greatly benefit from uh, 100,000 more young people leaving the country for a year or two years uh, uh, to, to learn about the rest of the world and also to, to, to talk to the rest of the world about America. In New Zealand, if you haven't spent two years abroad, you, it sort of goes down badly uh, with employers and, and, and so on. What is the kind of change that would have to happen in the United States to make it acceptable for people leaving college or even before they go to college to spend a year or two traveling, seeing the world, volunteering, without it looking bad on their resumes, without it somehow being kind of frowned upon by prospective employers? What, what, is it, what are the kinds of changes that you see that would need to happen? I, I think we've already had a lot of that change, thanks to AmeriCorps. I mean, as I said, there have been, there have been 500,000 people who have done AmeriCorps in the past 14 years. There have been almost 200,000 people who have done the Peace Corps. And what I've found from my work with City Year is that City Year graduates actually get into better schools and do better in school after spending a year doing City Year. It does still go against the grain a little bit. People feel like, well, I might get off the track. But what we've seen, you know, now we've had over 10,000 people do a year at City Year, and there have been hundreds of thousands doing AmeriCorps, is that employers look at them better, admissions offices look at them better, they look at themselves better, they're more focused. So I think that's, it's already happening. I think the second thing what we need really is just to, to create the kind of GI Bill that I'm talking about. We need both young people to demand it, to say they want to serve. Every year there are many more people who are applying to AmeriCorps and the Peace Corps than have the option. But then ultimately we need the political will. We need political leaders to recognize we've got to take our young people seriously. And that if we really did have a million people, if we offered this kind of GI Bill, we would change the country. I mean, we like to talk about the American dream here in America, but how do we make that real? I think if we had a new GI Bill, it became real for everybody who came back from World War II. If we had a new GI Bill, every single young person in this country could get the American dream if they were willing to serve. So, but I think it's, it's gotta come from you all. It's gotta come from citizens. The political leaders, you know, I think the problem is there's no constituency. Unfortunately, a lot of politics in America is around interest groups. There isn't an interest group that's saying we should have national service because it's, it benefits everybody. So, you know, it's going to, I think, ultimately take young people, people who've done AmeriCorps, people who want to serve, to push the candidates, especially in this election that's, that's coming up, around this idea. And we know how to do it. We've had 20 years of experience with national service, starting with President Bush 41, by the time the next president takes office. So it's not a question of how do you do this, or can it work, or is it a good program? It's really a question, do we have the will, and are we willing to invest the resources to take our young people seriously? We'll move sort of clockwise around, and so it's your turn. Hi, my name, name is Angela from Korea. I am Kennedy School alumni. Thank you for your inspirational speech. Uh, I'm sure that among uh, this audience, uh, there are many people who want to be a social entrepreneur like you. 
And then I would like to ask a question that what was the most challenging crisis in your life with the city year? And then how did you overcome it? Thanks. Uh, uh, Angela, thank you for that question. You know, the first thing that, uh, I thought you asked me what advice would you give people, which I'll get to. Um, you know, the first thing that popped into my head was uh, we had a city or corps member that was killed uh, in 1971, October 1st. His name was Tyrone Gunn, and he was a victim of random violence in Boston. That year, 151 young people were killed in the city of Boston. Uh, and unfortunately, the violence is coming back. And it was only three weeks into the program. It was only our second year. And uh, it kind of rocked our world. Um, Tyrone was a, was a good young man. He was uh, very involved and committed. And it kind of shook all of us to say, oh my god, I mean, this is directly touching us now. And uh, you know, we, ultimately, when you're, when you're that directly touched by violence, it, it affects you. And ultimately, we came together stronger. But it, it was challenging, because we were very new and we were very young. And it sort of said, wow, this is real. What we're doing is real. Uh, and it's serious. And it led all of us to recommit. Um, and the way we dealt with it, frankly, was by reaching out. I mean, I, I called a dear friend of mine, Charlie Rose, who at that point was on our board, who was leading the effort to work with young people in Boston, and Hubie Jones. And we reached out to uh, the Judge Baker Center on grief counseling. And the, the way we got through it was just reaching out to a lot of people uh, and taking the time to grieve and, and asking the core members, how do you want to memorialize him? We actually have a conference room now that's permanently endowed at City or the Tyrone Gun Conference Room. Um, but that was the first thing that came to my mind. Uh, the second thing was the AmeriCorps crisis. The, three years ago, three and a half years ago, uh, the AmeriCorps funding was gutted by 80% overnight. There was no notice at all. And it wasn't because of anything programs had done. It was because of mismanagement in Washington. Uh, and it was a similar response. We sort of got together, a group of us, AmeriCorps program leaders, and said, we got to turn this around. And I think, you know, again, what, what turned it around, and we ultimately did turn it around, and actually got an increased funding for AmeriCorps, it was people coming together. So I guess, you know, I hadn't thought about this until you asked me. I guess my, my answer would be is, when you're faced with big challenges, rally people around you. It's a personal challenge, rally your personal network. If it's an organizational or professional challenge, rally your professional network. Um, I thought when you started your question, you asked me for advice if you want to be a social entrepreneur. So I'll just, I'll, I'll say a word on that. A couple things. Find a partner. That was the key for me at City Year. I mean, as I said, I started City Year with my college roommate, best friend Michael Brown, and we quickly built a team of people. So find a partner and build a team. Uh, and the second thing I would say is uh, figure out what's important to you. What's at the core of what you want to do? What's the integrity of your idea? And don't compromise on that, no matter what. But be flexible on everything else. And I think if you can manage to do that, uh, you'll succeed. Thank you for the question. So over here. Hi, my name is Roshan Paul, and I'm a an, uh, first year MPP student uh, from India. Uh, you talked a lot about the, the battle between cynicism and idealism as being the defining struggle, and I think that's a very profound way of putting it. I've actually had that on my email signature for the last few years. Um, we got to get to know each other. Yeah. <laughs> I read it from, in Billy Shore's book, uh, uh, on the Cathedral Within. Anyway, uh, you gave us a list of um, things that we need to do to make the world better, but I wonder if progress on those fronts can only come about by, uh, based on the outcome of this battle. And so my question is, uh, as you look around the world today, uh, and in this country, which side do you think is winning that battle? And more importantly, why? And if you decide it's cynicism, then uh, why is that happening, and what can we do about it? And if you decide it's idealism, what can we do to strengthen that? Uh, that's a great question. I never really thought about it that way. I, I would say, well, I'm an idealist, so I'd say idealism is a little bit ahead. Um, <laughs> but it's close. Uh, you know, and I think, and I, and I think it's coming back. I mean, I, you know, one of the things I learned here at Harvard was Arthur Schlesinger has this theory of cycles of history, and that we move from periods of reform and big change to then a conservative reaction, retrenchment, corruption, and then reform again. And I think we're sort of on the edge of that cycle now, where people are, are ready for reform and for change. Um, but as I said, I think people have to understand that, that uh, it doesn't happen by accident. That's my daughter up there. <laughs> Hi, sweetie. Um, and her friend, Orla. 
it's nice to have your own fan club. Um, uh, I think that the key is we've got to understand, you have to understand that it is a battle and that you've got to pick a side. Um, and I hope that you will decide to pick to be on the side of idealism. And I think that if, if we all engage in it, idealism will definitely win. If you, think, if you look at history over time, idealism wins. But the question is, how, how hard is it going to be? How long does it take? I mean, as I said, you know, when you start the founding of the country, the abolitionists, the suffragists, civil rights movement, trade unionists, over time, we definitely make big progress. But, you know, and sometimes it comes, you know, at, at huge sacrifice. So uh, I think idealism is a little bit ahead right now, but I think, you know, what's, what's exciting to me is that we're at a point now, and I mention this, in history where we have a chance for true citizen-led change unlike ever before in, in all of human history. And that's partially because of technology, it's because of globalization, it's the world has become much smaller. You think of these things like YouTube and Meetup and MySpace, all that stuff I talked about. Um, and we're on the cutting edge of that. Uh, and it could be unbelievable, but you gotta get involved. It won't happen by accident. And unfortunately, you know, the opposition is great that, you know, the, the the entrenched power doesn't give way. And change doesn't happen by accident. So um, I'm glad that you're, you're engaged in this. I encourage you to keep doing it. I'm Tashita Ranshin. I'm a mid-career MPA student at the Kennedy School. And um, Alan, as you know, I'm a big, big fan of the AmeriCorps program. And your work in particular has been a great inspiration to me. Thank um, you. I was just wondering that how do you move from the whole volunteering public service aspect to actually being in a position to influence public policy? I mean, what would it take to move from merely uh, participating on a voluntary basis to be in a position of influence? And do you have to run for office? Do you have to hold public office? Or is there any other mechanism to be in the position to effect change? Well, um, I think that's an excellent question, Tushita. Thank you. I would say a couple of things. As I said, Harry Truman said the highest office in a democracy is that of citizen. Unfortunately, most people don't hold that office. They don't think of themselves as actually holding an office. As a citizen, you have a lot of power. The first thing you've got to do is band with other citizens, people that you care about. Uh, you can affect change. Um, whether you, can, you can be involved in the political process without necessarily running for office, although I think more people need to do that. Um, what we did at Cityer was something called, we called the action tank approach to change. And I think if you're, if you're trying to change the world, whether you're volunteering, whether you're working with one child, teach them to read whatever, you won't get to big change unless you engage in the public policy process. And that's the great thing about democracy. At the end of the day, we are in charge. We have to decide how the resources are allocated and what's going to happen. And so what we did at Cityer was say, we're going to be an action tank. What does that mean? Well, we're going to work on the policy side the way a think tank does. But we're also going to do, uh, show that it could work the way a program does because people want to see what works. And then we use that to appeal to candidates and CEOs and leaders in our country to say, hey, this idea can work. And that's what happened. You know, we got lucky, we got the right people to visit, but, but we were ready for it and we encouraged it. So if you're, if you're working in the nonprofit sector, I'd encourage you to think about what is your action tank approach? How, are you, how is the work you're doing gonna change public policy? You know, because, I mean, think about philanthropy. There's about $250 billion a year that's given in philanthropy, and most of that goes to institutions of higher education and, and, and faith-based institutions. The federal government spends $2.7 trillion. So where are the resources? Uh, so that's one thing I would say. And the second thing I would say is, you know, use your democratic voice. Uh, get involved. Show up when candidates come to speak or come to, to talk. You know, and ask, get them to be specific. Force them to say, what are you really going to do? I mean, again, I think we need a new agenda, but I think that we have to hold our candidates accountable, not just for platitudes or generalities, but what are you really going to do? And push them to get beyond what they think and their consultants are saying is politically possible. Um, I think ultimately it's going to be up to citizens that can make the change. But you, if you're involved in change and you're not involved in politics, you're cutting yourself short at some uh, level. Hello, my name is Matthew Kleinstiver. I'm a student at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, my question kind of is about what you were talking about earlier, your, your strong belief in the kind of the, the new youth to you know, overturn the old political system. And I was wondering what markers you had, you know, 
given that you know the youth of today are seen as people who look at Game Boys and you know the internet and don't really have any you know strong political motivations or are generally apathetic, what markers, quantitative or otherwise, do you have that you know today's youth are the generation that are going to make some sort of change? In you know, I, I, it's a, I'll, I'll give you a marker, then I'll give you another thought. I'll give you one really powerful marker. In the 2004 election, more people, there were more votes by people under 30 than there were by people over 65. More votes. Now, I, I bet most of you didn't know that. It doesn't get talked about. I mean, we talk about the elderly vote, the seniors vote. The, you know, that's, more people under 30 voted, 18 to 30, than people over 65 in the 2004 election, according to the you know, CNN exit polls. That's one powerful marker. Youth voting is increasing. Uh, I can give you another marker. Uh, your generation is volunteering at levels never before seen. Never before seen. It's been increasing you know, over the past 20 years that we've been done city year. Every year it goes up. That shows that, that you care. Uh, so that's another marker. I can tell you from my own experience with city year, city year core members vote at almost twice the rate of their peers. They volunteer at three times the rate. So another marker is just the national service movement itself, AmeriCorps. Uh, and there have been studies that have shown that people who do AmeriCorps are much more civically engaged. That's why I'm such a big believer in let's take this to scale. Let's make it universally available. But the interesting thing is, you know, there is, and I also think, you know, the other markers I gave in terms of history, young people are often at the forefront of change, and yet we don't talk about it that way, I think, because we're afraid of it. And it's not just, you're, you know, you talk about your generation and Game Boys. When, you know, in the 50s, it was the beatniks. In the 60s, it was, uh, you know, in the 70s, it was the me generation. In the 80s, it was yuppies. Then we ran out of names, and we said it was Generation X. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's always, you know, some kind of label we put on young people. And I think it's because we're afraid to release what I think is a naturally idealistic time. So don't listen to the labels. Um, get involved. Uh, your generation, I think, you know, Robert Putnam, who's a professor here, has done some recent research about the 9-11 effect. That's another marker. I don't know all these statistics, but he, well, his research has shown that, you know, after 9-11, the whole country spiked up in terms of civic involvement. And yet, except for the 18 to 24 demographic, it's gone back to where it was. With your generation, it stayed up, another marker. And you know, his theory is that we actually have the potential for the next gen greatest generation is your generation. Because of 9-11, because of Katrina, because of service, uh, and also because of the empowerment that's happening through technology. So I, uh, I think there's a lot of examples out there that, that actually say uh, you guys can lead the change. Hello, my name is Rance Graham Bailey I'm from Stanford University. My question is kind of springboarding off that. With the outpour of uh, volunteering in the Gulf Coast after Katrina, um, I was wondering if you've heard of the Gulf Coast Civic Works Project, and if not, just in general, if that was an opportunity for, I guess, in, uh, encouraging civic participation. Uh, Can you. you talk about, I mean, I, I know of a number of things that are going on in the Gulf Coast. Uh, we started City Year in Louisiana right after uh, Hurricane Katrina. Uh, can you talk about what the Civic Works Project is? I don't know too much about it. I mean, it was brought to my attention like three days ago, but it's a, it's a bill sitting in Congress right now uh, just meant to, I just deal with the aftermath by mm -hmm. encouraging, um, I guess, volunteering and I guess kind of like a New Deal type of legislation in terms of, uh, I guess, WPA has been mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. contemporary. Um, I don't know it specifically. I will say this. I think that uh, Katrina is another example, I think, of, of sort of we're in this battle and, and there's you know, good things and bad things. I mean, the incredibly devastating thing about Katrina is that it's over a year later and the truth is we haven't made that much progress. I know this just from the work that City is doing in Louisiana and, and, and seeing that there is so much more still to be done. It's incredible in a country that has this much wealth that we would allow this to continue 16, 17 months later. Um, that's the bad news, and that we haven't been able, and that's why I think we need a new politics, and we need a new role for government. The old way of government failed for Katrina, at the local level, the state level, and the federal level. The good news is there has been a rush of the voluntary sector, of people wanting to volunteer, of nonprofit organizations, of companies. Um, 
you know, doing their meetings down there. I have a good friend here, Carolyn Casey, and she works at Timberland. They organized their, their national sales meeting there and did a whole day of service. There's an incredible desire of people uh, to want to make a difference, and I think Katrina showed that. Um, and yet there's a gap between our political leadership and where our citizens are at, and we've got to close that gap. And something like what you're talking about, I think, could help with that. You know, one of the things I pushed after Katrina is let's expand AmeriCorps dramatically to, to bring up whole, you know, thousands of young people into the Gulf Coast. You know, that went nowhere. Um, but it's not too late. Hi, my name is Wilson Tong. I attend the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, first, I want to thank you very much for taking time out to speak to us. Uh, and I want to preface my question uh, first by saying I, I definitely think that people should become more involved in, in public service, community service. However, I've always had some reservations about that in the sense that um, I think that while community service is great and that people should volunteer, it can also be very dangerous. Dangerous, broadly speaking, in the sense that um, for some people who volunteer who might not understand the context of the community in which they're going to perform work, and I think that it's an integral component in making a difference, one that is productive. So I was just wondering what your thoughts were on that. Thank you. Uh, I, I think it's a really good point, Wilson. You know, it, and one of the things we try to do at City Year, and I think good service learning programs do, is, is you have to understand the context. You've got to take the time to understand you know, uh, what's going on, what's happening in those neighborhoods, how did the situation get to be the way it is, whether it's our public school system, or dealing with homelessness, or the environment, or whatever. Um, I wouldn't go so far as to say I think it's dangerous. I think that uh, it, it's not as productive if people just volunteer. One of the, the things that I think is important is, and that's why I'm pushing this message of politics today, uh, is we have to close the gap. I mean, you know, there was this, there's this terrible saying, you know, or anecdote where somebody said, you know, they went and they went to volunteer at a homeless shelter and they brought their kids and afterwards they said, well, I hope it's here 20 years from now so that my grandchildren can volunteer. You know, no, we want to get rid of the homeless shelter. Um, but I think the key is, as I said before, you've got to connect your, your service work. And I think everybody should be involved in service work because that's the first step. You know, Gandhi taught there were three keys to building a democracy. What he said, the ballot, the, the spinning wheel or the spade, and the jail. Well, the ballot's the rights you get by just being a citizen democracy, a right to vote, free speech, et cetera. The jail is civil disobedience when you give up your rights. But Gandhi said that the most important of the three was the spinning wheel of the spade, which was the willingness of citizens to go out and do the hard, day-to-day, -day, unglamorous work of building a democratic society, teaching people to read, building housing for the homeless, taking care of the elderly, taking care of the sick, doing economic empowerment. And he said that was the most important because unless you're engaged in that, you, know, you don't care enough to vote or your vote isn't meaningful. And you certainly won't get your justice nerve turned on strong enough so that you're willing to give up your liberty through civil disobedience. So I think it starts with service. But it needs to start there. And then people have to decide, OK, if you've been working in a public school and you realize that change needs to be made, what are you going to push to actually change policy so that the resources get there and the, and the conditions change? But I think your point about understanding the context is key to that. Thank you. Hi, Alan. I'm Carolyn Casey, and I am an alumni of the Kennedy School, 98. And the first time I can publicly thank Alan because of um, his support, I came to the Kennedy School. And I just wanted to, um, with a caveat that the answer can't um, be about Timberland, because that's where I work. And this isn't about Timberland. It's more about um, that the, the movement for social change isn't um, relegated to the nonprofit sector. And I think that one of the powerful things that City Year has done and social, social entrepreneurs have done is they have changed the way that the private sector not only thinks, but acts. And that there are as, as many uh, graduates of HBS going into social entrepreneurship as there are from the Kennedy School. And um, I thought your talk was wonderful, but you didn't spend a lot of time talking about the role that the national service movement has had on the private sector. And so I just wanted you to comment on multi-sector collaboration. I think it's key. Thank you for raising it, Carolyn. Um, you know, I think that big change is going to come in the future from the intersection of the nonprofit world, the government, and the private sector. And in fact, the future leaders are going to be people that are comfortable with all three and often move between all three and can figure out how to bring all three together. That's because you need the expertise and the power 
and the resources of all three to solve any big problems. And that's what we've tried to do with Cityor. That's what's happened with AmeriCorps. And there are a lot, and there has been a big sea change in the past 20 years where businesses are recognizing that they have a corporate social responsibility. Uh, and in fact, again, this is another marker. You know, there have been studies by uh, a group right here, Carol Cohn's organization, that says consumers or more likely to buy products from companies that they think reflect their values, either because of their corporate social responsibility policies, their environmental policies, their hiring policies, et cetera, their corporate giving policies, than from companies that don't. And again, I think at the end of the day, it starts with all of you, and it starts with citizens. Business leaders reflect what the consumers want. And part of it's, you know, 70% of the people work in the private sector. So if you all demand it, it'll happen whether with your consumer dollars or where you choose to work. But there has been a real progress on this front, uh, and I think that's the future. And as I said, you know, uh, we've got to take the techniques that we know work in business and apply them to the public sector, and often it's by getting people in business involved. I mean, that's how we built Cityer. We've had wonderful private sector leadership right from the beginning. And the, the national service movement, I mean, there's been over a billion dollars has been invested by private companies in AmeriCorps programs since the program was started. So uh, it's a really good point, and it's definitely, I think, part of the, the key for the future. These Last have been one. a great set of questions. We're going to take the final three. Okay, so the folks who are at the mics now. Yeah. Um, hi, my name's Rachel McCullough, and I go to the University of Delaware. And I was interested in the situation in Darfur. Um, where the UN has passed resolutions, it's been called a genocide, but yet the countries that have the resources to go in there and really you know, put an end to the violence haven't done anything. And I was wondering what you thought needs to happen to really see a change there. Uh, I'm glad you brought it up. It's, um, it's unfathomable to me what's going on. I mean, we talked about, you know, never forget, you know, it seems like it's genocide. I mean, there's a wonderful woman here, Samantha Powers literally wrote the book on this, Problem from Hell about genocide. And unfortunately, for whatever reason, you know, we don't come to grips with it. I think it's because, you know, in the Sudan, it's not geopolitically strategic. If it was on top of a bunch of oil or had some other kind of resources, maybe we'd care more. Uh, but I don't think we should give up. You know, I think the answer is we need more citizen movements. If you think, if you study history again, what makes change in this country and in any country that's a democracy, it's when you have strong citizen movements that then push courageous political leadership. So I know there's been work done here on campus. I think there's got to be more of a citizen movement led by college students to say, end it, enough. We know what we can do in Sudan. We could intervene. We could rally the world and say, this has to stop. You know, we, we, uh, President Clinton has said his biggest regret as president was letting the Rwanda crisis go on. So why are we doing this again. I think we're so distracted by other things. Um, but I think, you know, a bunch of young people and others who care about this, uh, there's a wonderful woman right here in Boston named Reverend Gloria White Hammond who's literally leading the national effort to end the genocide. So people are working on this, but, you know, we've got to raise it up. You know, there's a campaign going on now. One thing you can do, those of you that live in either Iowa or here in Boston and get up to New Hampshire, if you live in South Carolina or Nevada, you can meet the next President of the United States. If you care about this, show up and make sure you ask that question and say, what are you going to do? Will you pledge? I mean, a bunch of candidates right now are talking about if they're elected president, they will end the Iraq war. Which candidate's going to say, if you elect me, I will stop the genocide? Uh, and you know, there's an interesting story about Senator McCain. Um, you know, he voted against AmeriCorps in national service. But after the 2000 presidential campaign, almost every stop he went to he said, well, I call on young people to serve a cause larger than themselves. Somebody in the audience stood up and said, I did AmeriCorps. And by the end of that campaign, he changed around his mind, and he became the biggest champion in the Congress for AmeriCorps. So I'd, I'd urge you to, to seize this opportunity of this campaign uh, and fight for this. It's a, it's, it's a terrible tragedy that we're letting this go on. And, and you know, history's going to look back and say, you know, what were we doing? Yes. Hi. My name is Lorenzo. I'm a master's student at the Ed School. Um, you spoke about teachers, and I was really happy to hear that part where you said teachers should be better paid. Um, but, like, if 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 the for me the interesting part of your solution is you know the role of students and also teachers, and I'm, I'm I, I keep thinking to myself if the question is we have to build better citizens, obviously we do that in schools. Mm -hmm. my, my question is, 
I think the pay would be one good, it'd help a lot. But then how do we change this impression that most people get, and I, and I feel this a lot when, when, I, when I do what I do, that some people are like, okay, teaching is a good thing to do, good for you, and yet there's this perception that I wouldn't, I mean, this, this is someone else speaking, it's a good thing to do, but I wouldn't do it personally. You know, like, you know, I mean, I do it, it uh, if I wanted to, but I just don't want to. I mean, how do we change that? I mean, thinking of getting people not just to teach for a year, um, teach for America style, but you know, in the long term, in the long run, and just you know, to share these ideals and form these ideals in our schools. Mm -hmm. I think it's fundamental, I really do. And I think, you know, as I mentioned, I'd say a couple things. One, we have to completely revamp our educational approach. I mean, the educational system we have now was really, it started in the agrarian age, it was really designed for the industrial age. You know, kids getting out at two o'clock, a short school day, only 180 days a year in school. Uh, and we've got to recognize that in the 21st century, when we're competing globally, when you have to basically have a college education to be an active citizen as well as to be able to have a good job, we've got to really look at the whole system and be willing to, 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 to almost start from scratch and reimagine it. And there are some wonderful social entrepreneurs working on this who've started KIPP, who New Leaders for New Schools, you mentioned Teach for America, and others. Education sector, Andy Rotherham is, is doing that. So we have to look at the whole thing. I think it, it starts with teachers. And that, as I said, we've got to make teaching the most revered profession. I mean, I, I, I know, I mean, my daughter's four years old now. After my wife and myself and our family, the people who have the most impact on her are her teachers. I'm sure all of you, if I asked you, can you tell me a favorite teacher? Every single one of you is going to have somebody that changed your life who was a teacher. So I think it starts there. I think we have to make it possible for people to be in a profession. I think we've got to dramatically increase pay to six-figure salaries so people can afford to be a teacher and afford to buy a home and send their own kids to college so they can do it as a career. But we've also got to have other reforms. We've got to have more accountability. We've got to have longer school days. We've got to have longer school years. We've got to be able to have a progression where it's not just based on seniority, it's based on excellence. People have to be able to start as a teacher and become a principal if they want, or even become a superintendent so that it's seen as a profession where you're going into the profession of education, you're starting as a teacher. And we've got to hold, hold teaching up. So I do think we've got to pay a lot more, but we've also got to look at how we're going to change the system. Uh, and we have to do this. We have to do it ethically. We have to do it so we have better citizens. We have to do it competitively if we want to uh, maintain our, our economic edge. And we've got to do it for our democracy. So I, I'm glad you're working on it. And, you mentioned Teach for America, and yes, it's only two years, but what Wendy Kopp has shown, what Teach for America has shown is people will go into teaching. I mean, within a year or two, Teach for America is going to be the single largest recruiter on college campuses in the country, more than Goldman Sachs or McKinsey or Bain or any corporate company. That says a lot. People are willing to do it, but I've talked to a lot of Teach for America alums. Some of them stay in it. Some of them drop out because they feel like the system is broken. It doesn't reward enough excellence. It doesn't enable them to have that kind of career path. It doesn't enable them to, to have a living. So I think it's, it's, it's both. But I'm glad you're working on it. Well, I'm such a pushover. So final two questions, and we'll okay. go up there to the Loge first, please. Hello, my name is India Robinson. I'm a PPLC attendee, and I attend Spelman College. And, um, this idea of idealism is rather exciting because I was always told growing up, oh, you're such an idealist, like it was a negative thing. So um, I guess when you, you know, you've placed like this mark on us that, you know, we are the generation that's going to be the change that we want to see. Mm -hmm. So do you think with the presidential candidates, I don't, I mean, 50 years ago, would we ever imagine an African-American man and a woman running for presidential candidates? I think that, like, do you think that the foundation is being laid for us with this, um, with this new pres um, president in 2008? Absolutely, and there's a leading uh, Latino candidate for president too. And there's a lot, and there are people from all different backgrounds. Um, I, you know, absolutely, it's a great example. The country's changed. Fifty years ago, you know, African Americans didn't really have the right to vote in this country, and women had only had the right to vote for thirty years. So there's definitely been real change. Um, and you know, part of the reason I, I, I talked about idealism versus cynicism is because you know, because from what you said, you know. Previous questioner asked who's winning the battle. Well, one of the things that cynics have done is they've made idealism almost like a dirty word. And that's why I emphasize, you know, idealism is simply just forming ideals and living under their influence. We all do that. We all have ideals. And we all try to live by them. Ideals of family, of faith, of love, of caring for friends, neighbors. So, um, and I do think that there is change coming. And I do think your generation in particular. And also America's changing. 
Within 20 years, there'll be no majority race in America, and that's a good thing. We, we, you know, uh, I asked uh, some of you what our, our biggest strengths are. A lot of you wrote, which I agree with, the diversity of our people, the fact that we're an immigrant country. We get people from all different backgrounds and all different talents. We, we have the best of the best here because we get so many different perspectives. So change is definitely coming. I think the campaign's one example of that. Um, and so I, I, I encourage you to get involved and, and uh, keep up the hope. Last but not least. I want to say thank you, first of all, for allowing me to address my question. Um, my name is Jayla Khatib. I am a junior at Cleveland State University in Cleveland, Ohio, and also a PPLC participant. Um, I know that you briefly stated earlier, um, you talked about the concept of a think tank and an action tank and how important it is to utilize a vehicle to, like that to affect change. Um, I was wondering what advice might you have for um, progressive youth leaders, such as myself and my PPLC constituents, um, and how to uh, establish a think tank uh, or create a think tank on our campus or in our community? And secondly, how uh, will we tap into those resources or what resources should we tap into? And how will we go about securing sustainability for an idea like that? Um, I'd say a couple of things. I'm glad you asked. Uh, as I said before, the first thing to do is Find a partner, build a team. Nobody changes the world by themselves. Even all those great leaders I talked about, they all had legions of young people behind them, in front of them, and beside them. So get a team together. Decide what your priorities are. You can't do everything. So decide what are your priorities gonna be. Uh, try to get some early wins. I mean, as I see, we started city with 50 people for just 10 weeks. And then we did 50 people for a year. And then we did 75 people for a year. Change takes time. But decide, you know, what, what's some early wins? How do we make some, some quick progress? Uh, use the technology that's available. It's unbelievable how you can organize through Meetup and through, um, you know, Google and MySpace and Facebook. So you can, you know, you can, you can find like-minded people much more easily now than, than it used to be on college campuses. Uh, pick the things that you care about. And as I said, be an action tank. Don't just do policy. Get engaged in service. Don't just do service, get engaged in policy. I mean, when I was here at the Kennedy School this fall, you know, one of the things I was talking to students about, it was interesting, there's a really active public service program and there's incredibly bright students doing policy work. And I said, you guys gotta connect together because your policy work will be better informed. Like if you're doing immigration policy, there's a whole bunch of students on every campus that are actually working with immigrants. So get them involved, for example. Um, and you're in Cleveland State, Ohio, very important state in the presidential campaign. You can't become president without winning Ohio. So you're gonna have candidates coming through there. Um, and I would take advantage of that. I'd use a website, I'd show up when candidates show up, and I would try to decide what's important and then use the technology to get other people, do you agree, do you support this? You know, whether it's Sudan or it's global warming or whatever the issues you care about. You know, can you, can you use Facebook other technology to say, you know, we got 10,000, we got 50,000, we got 100,000 people all of a sudden. Um, and I think it does start here. You know, talk to some of your friends here. You can have a big impact. And as a student, you know, the great thing is you got lots of resources right available to you. Um, you don't have to worry about where you're gonna sleep and how you're gonna eat. So, uh, and you got great, great leaders and professors that can help you, so I encourage you to do it. Thank you, Jayla, for the question. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Alan. Thank you for your thoughts. Thank you for your inspiration. Thank you for City Year and for bringing some of the City Year people here today. We're thrilled to have you. And thank you for your rugged idealism. Terrific talk. Thank you very much.